Hey, pleasant. Good evening to all of you. Thank you very much, Sister Jasmine, for that song. I always get nervous when somebody introduces me like Dr. Powering's introduction. I don't know what to say. I'm just praying that uh, I will live up to that introduction. And it's so difficult, you know. I, I'm, I'm just being honest. I'm just being open to you. I get nervous very much when somebody introduces me as a man of God. There are many things that go along with that uh, description. And I'm just praying that the Lord will help me to be really, for you today, a man of God. But I'm very happy also to be here with you because I know I'm not alone. I may be a man of God, but we are all his children. Yes, we are his children. And I'm very happy, privileged, privileged to be here with you and be part of your week of prayer. And I pray that the Lord will be with us as we carry on with this week of prayer meetings. Yes, I'd like to also say on behalf of the North Philippine Union Conference, I greet you. I pray that as we come together, study together, and contemplate on the goodness of the Lord, that we will be drawn closer to each other and closer to Him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you called us to be your children. One time, we were sinners. We still are. But we are very grateful to you because your grace sustains us. And the blood of Jesus cleansed us. And even though we are from time to time, sinning against you, we're so happy that you're always there to forgive us, to lift us up, and to draw us closer to you. Oh, Father, tonight, as we begin our week of prayer meetings, please be with us. Fill us with your spirit. And speak to us. May your spirit be in our midst tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Deep in the heart of every true-blooded Jew lies this one overwhelming all-encompassing desire to see the dawn of the kingdom of God. If the world were to come to an end, let it come, let it come, so long as it will herald the arrival of the kingdom. If my life were to be snuffed out and this mortal breath be taken away, let it be, so long as when I next open my eyes, I will behold the glorious, majestic face of my Messiah. And if I am to be banished to another place of existence, I care not a bit, so long as when I next take my steps, it will be to enter into the gates of the glorious new Jerusalem, the capital of the world, the city of God, the center of the entire universe. To the Jew, that is his train of thoughts. And Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. Ah, Jerusalem, the joy of every child of Abraham, the city of hope. I long to see your glory restored. 
I long to see your temple standing proud above all edifice. Your gates open to those who seek the might and mercy of Jehovah, the only true God, the creator of the universe, the giver of life. O Yahweh, as impure as my lips are, forgive me for uttering your most glorious, ineffable, most holy name. I open my mouth only to glorify you, to praise you, to let you know my one overwhelming desire is to see your kingdom realized, yes, realized in my lifetime. So let your words come to pass, my God. Let your power be manifested in all the world. Let your mighty spirit empower me, lead me to live my life for you and for you alone. Let this mortal body be cradled by the pure grace of my God whose mighty love set this world into being and whose mighty arms brought forth the great fountains of the deep, whose mighty voice called forth the multitude of stars in the heavenly realm and whose mighty words created the world and all that is in it. Almighty God, ruler of the universe, creator of life, merciful and mighty Father, look down upon us from heaven and consider us your puny, weakly, undeserving creatures, seeking your holiness. Now, O oh Father, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Praise be your holy name, Almighty God and Savior. Amen. Yes, consider how the average Jew thinks. He muses that it has been ages ago when God told the king of Israel through Nathan the prophet that the kingdom of David shall last and shall not be broken, nor taken away, nor shall enemies compass her about, nor overcome her, nor put her to desolation. It had been ages ago, almost an entire eternity had passed. Were these not the promises of God made in 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 17? As a Jew, have I misunderstood it? Have I not the right to long for it, to see it unfold before my very eyes? If it is to be true, might it not be realized in my lifetime? Might I not be given the chance, the opportunity to see the arrival of the kingdom? Would that the God of heaven allow me to live, to see the dawn of his kingdom, and to behold the Messiah, his arrival, his appearing? Thoughts like this had flooded the minds of young Jews like Peter, James, and John. And on this particular day, as they hold their catch of fish from the blue waters of Galilee, and as always, they inevitably hark back to their most cherished topic, their desire to see God's kingdom happen in their lifetime. When shall the kingdom come? When shall the Messiah appear to free them from the deathly clasps of the oppressive, overbearing, shaming Roman rule? As they continued to fish, they kept on thinking of that time when the kingdom of God would be realized. One more hole and they would be off. They'll be finished. They've had a relatively good catch thus far. It's good to go home now. They were talking to each other. But something startled them. Way out there, 
there seemed to be a shadow walking towards them. Who could this be? As their gaze followed this man who seemed so different, they noticed in him something that betrayed his identity. He had this look on his eyes that was so inviting, at the same time so challenging. Coming closer to them, this man finally looked at their direction and without flinching, blurted out words so compelling, so forceful, so irresistible. Follow me. I will make you fishers of men. No second words. No second thoughts. They put down their nets with all the fish in them and followed after Jesus. Further yonder, there were these two brothers, James and John. They too found the words of Jesus too persuasive, too gripping. They could not resist the invitation. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men soon. Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, Simon, Thaddeus, and finally even Judas Iscariot joined the group. Ultimately, there were 12 of them, disciples of Jesus, young men having known the hardships of life under the Roman powers, young men who harbor glorious thoughts of this Jesus, possibly being the Messiah. And so they followed him. He was the Messiah, all right. But his Messiahship was far from what they initially thought. Jesus taught them freedom. But it is freedom in the spirit. Jesus taught them to fight. But it was against the demons of sin reigning within. He brought their minds to focus on the kingdom. Yes, still the kingdom of David. But it was a Davidic kingdom with a decided spiritual slant that sent them into deep thinking whether Jesus, this Jesus, was really the Messiah they were longing for. It took them more than three and a half years before they were finally totally convinced that Jesus indeed was the Messiah. Along the way, one fell back. No more to join them. Yes, Jesus indeed was the Messiah. And what a Messiah he was. They saw his works and they were mighty works. He healed the sick, brought back the sight of the blind, restored the hearing of the deaf, made the lame to walk again, and even returned the life of those who were claimed by death already. And what powerful words he spoke when he uttered words. They were unlike the Pharisees and the scribes. They were words spoken out of love, out of grace, out of compassion. He spoke without pretension. He spoke the truth, and he restored people's understanding of God's ways, of God's plan. He spoke like no other. But the most visible and very crucial thing that they noticed about him in his personality and in his ministry, they noticed that he lived out what he spoke. He lived out what he spoke about. Today we call it, he walked the talk. 
And as far as drawing the attention of people back to God, he portrayed God as a God who would have himself be understood. In the Old Testament, prophets and messengers, writers and inspired men and women of God talked about God and portrayed him as the God of all goodness. Yahweh was the Lord, the Lord God who is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity and trans of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. This God of the universe who created the world and all that is in it is the God who himself declares, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. Great God, mighty God. The greatness of this God is a greatness that did not prevent him from being aloof from the needs and concerns of his children. In fact, this God is the same God who in Isaiah asked, Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem, or have I no power to deliver? The truth is, this God is not only able to deliver, he is so concerned with me, with you, that David, in understanding this God as the God who is so compassionate and loving, wants you and I to consider him as the Lord who is my shepherd I shall not want. This God is the shepherd who cares for his children that he makes, he makes me to lie down in green pastures as one of his children. He is also the one who restores my soul. He is also concerned for my personal welfare and safety that he leads me into the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He never wants me to go by myself. That he also assures me that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he is with me. And his rod and his staff, they comfort me. He also anoints my head with oil that my cup runs over, meaning that his provisions for me are more than I can imagine, even in the presence of my most feared enemies if I have them. I have nothing to worry about because he lets me have peace and even prepares my table for me. This is the God who loves me so much that he wants me to dwell with him forever. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? This God loves me so much and loves you so much that He wants you and me to live with Him forever, for eternity. This is the God that the Old Testament spoke about, declared about. The God that many people, by the time the New Testament came into the picture, it's a kind of God that many people have lost sight of through the passing of years. By the time Jesus came into the picture, God's people came to have this understanding of a totally different God. And Jesus in the New Testament sought to restore people's understanding of God. He told God's people that God cares for them, has compassion for them, and wants them to know God is so personally desirous to be close to his people as they face the vicissitudes of life. Jesus brought out to the Jews, to Israel, this portrait of the God who so relate to his children in love and concern. In a graphic, very graphic illustration, Jesus asks them in Matthew 10, 29 to 31, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet, not one of them will fall to the ground 
apart from the will of your father. And continuing, Jesus assures those who give it to God that even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Finally, Jesus comforts them with the word. So, don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. There are numerous, numerous wonderful words Jesus spoke to his disciples. Many powerful works he performed for them. Many noble and profound teachings he relayed to them. All this because in his heart of hearts, Jesus knew that in his person and work, he brought with him the kingdom of God. But it was not the understanding of people when he first came into the picture. Someone had to come before him and make the announcement calling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And after his baptism, Jesus made the very same announcement he proclaimed in Mark 1.15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Brethren, people of God, you and I know very well that Jesus truly, sincerely, historically, theologically brought in the kingdom of God, also known as the kingdom of heaven, also known as the kingdom of David. When he came to this world and lived amongst the children of Israel, for Jesus, this whole idea of the kingdom of heaven is very, very, very important. Before we go into any theological discussion on that, we're not going to be doing that tonight. Or even before we go into any study about the kingdom of God, let me draw this one thing to all of you. Jesus desires above all else that his kingdom be first lived in the hearts and minds, in the lives of his children while on earth. There is no uncertainty, no doubt that the kingdom of heaven is not just at hand or nearing. The kingdom of God is come or has come upon us. It is, in fact, within us. And those who have accepted Jesus in their lives as their Savior know very well that He has returned to heaven where He used to be with the Father. He also promised He will return. He is coming very soon. While here on earth, Jesus wants us, His children, to so live out in our lives the principles of His kingdom to the point where we become His disciples, witnesses to the nations, manifesting in our lives the very character of Jesus. And when that is done, He will come. I'm not a young man anymore, but I'm not very old either. But I've been hearing and I've been saying, preaching to congregations, telling this to individuals, that yes, Jesus is coming. He's coming very, very soon. You are familiar with, or you probably have heard of the program of the union right now together with the cooperation of South Philippine Union Conference and Central Philippine Union Conference that we are on the verge of acquiring a nationwide television network. Many are asking, why do we need at this time 
when there is so much need for us to go out and spend every single centavo we can spend into preaching the gospel? Why do we need to come up with a nationwide television network? There's only one reason, and that is our normal evangelistic efforts have not been able to reach as many people as possible. There remains a large class of people up there in high society that have, have not been given the privilege to really know the gospel as we know it. And we have this understanding, we have this firm belief that when we get this television network going on, many, many people will come to understand this God of our kingdom. This God of His kingdom. And we have this firm conviction that when many people are given, when all people have been given the privilege to decide for themselves to accept Jesus. And together with the work in the church of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in us, helping us overcome sin every day, help him, helping us to grow daily in understanding Jesus and growing up in grace and eventually manifesting in our lives the character, the pure character of Jesus, then Jesus will come. And this is an event that I am really longing to see in my time. The Jews of the times of Jesus, they were looking for the Messiah. They were waiting for the kingdom to arrive. When it came in the person of Jesus, they did not fully understand what Jesus was saying about the kingdom. Today, those of us who have lived these recent years, we know what the kingdom of God is. And throughout this week, we will every now and then bring out points that will help us understand what the kingdom of God is as we relate to that kingdom personally. But I want you to know one thing. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of David has come. Those of us who accepted Jesus, we know that the kingdom of heaven rules in our hearts, rules in our minds. In our teaching, in our doctrinal theological understanding, we know that the kingdom of God has, so to speak, three phases. The kingdom of the law, the kingdom of grace, the kingdom of glory. Today we believe we are in that sphere of time where after Jesus was manifested on earth and gave up his life on the cross for you and for me, we have entered and are now into that kingdom of grace. What is next? What is next is the kingdom of glory. It will be that time when Jesus will soon appear. The second time to bring in his children to that glorious kingdom, prepared for those who trusted in Him, who lived their lives for Him, who bore patiently life in faith, who were patient as they face the challenges and trials of life, who stayed with Jesus and will stay with Jesus until His second manifestation. Yes, soon there will be a loud cry, a call for all who care, a certain sound to be proclaimed to all who would want to listen. That call is given to anyone who cares to notice, to listen. The time is at hand. Jesus is coming. Will you be there to welcome him 
As he comes to bring his children to live with him and enter with him into that glorious kingdom, he prepared for all of those who love his appearing. You know, life on earth is so boring for people who do not have anything better to do it is boring but for a lot of the children of God life on earth is so dreadful so full of trials so sad with so much death and destruction all around so much sickness conflicts so much sin and accompanying tribulations I want to be in heaven with Jesus because he wants me there in the first place it's a glorious place the kingdom of glory the kingdom of God no more sorrow no more dying no more crying no more sickness no more sin no more evil or unrighteousness that will separate us from God's love by the power of the Holy Spirit given by Jesus by the grace of Jesus himself by the love of the Father I have decided to be there will you come with me I need to say this. Lovely institution, Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies. Dr. Ragui, I cherish those times when I used to be here. Those were happy times. Great institution, great theologians. Great students, great faculty, great staff. I was once also a teacher at Adventist University of the Philippines. Great institution, great school. I've also come to know many other institutions, not just schools, not just hospitals, printing presses also. I have visited many, many churches, not just here in the Philippines, but in other places as well. Why am I saying this? Well, there was one time when somebody from one of our churches came to me and asked me a very, very painful question to hear. He said, Pastor, what am I to do? Why? I asked. What's wrong with you? I think I'm lost. You think you're lost? What made you say that? I don't know. I think I, think I have not really known my Jesus as I am supposed to know him. My life is in shambles. I don't know where to go. I'm confused. That same set of questions was asked to me by a pastor. I was shocked. And that same set of questions were asked me by one of our students. I was shocked. And I was wondering how many more brethren, how many more Adventists will be coming to me and asking me the same set of questions. I'm lost. What am I supposed to do? What am, what am I going to do? Can you help me? I don't know how lost you are. Is it possible that here in this great institution somebody would be lost? Not knowing how to relate to Jesus? Is it possible that in the multitude of theology, in the multitude of teachings that we have, in the multitudes of books that we have in our library that somebody is lost? not knowing what to do next. I don't know. But that reminds me of a story, and I will close on this, that took place in London. 
I love to recite that story because it's a story that tells me what I can do and what you can do if you are lost. I was also lost one time. Well, Mary is a five-year-old girl. Her mother came that day, that afternoon, and uh, her mother told Mary, Mary, go change your clothes. We're going to go to downtown London, and we're going to be doing window shopping. No second words, no second thoughts. Mary changed her clothes, and soon they were walking in the streets of London. And it was so beautiful. It was so nice because it was Christmas. Lovely lights. Different lights, different colors. Many people. And there is this Christmas songs. Christmas songs. You can hear them. Mary was so enthralled. She was so happy. She was so enamored. She forgot that her mother was with her. When she came to, she couldn't find her mom. She looked behind, sideways, no mother. And she st started to shout, Mother, mother, where are you? Mother, where are you? No mother. And then, she realized that she was lost. She didn't know if her mother was lost. Children sometimes think they are lost, and sometimes they also think that their mothers or fathers are lost. But Mary was definitely lost. Unable to do anything, she sat down on the curb, or curb, as they call it there, and started to cry. That's the only thing a lost child would always do, cry. A policeman soon came to her and asked her, Mary. He came to know her name. Mary, you need to stop crying because if you keep on crying, you will never be able to help yourself and you'll never be able to help me help you. Where do you live? I live in a house beside the road. What's the name of your mother? Sometimes I call her mommy. What's the name of your father? Oh, most times I call her daddy. I, I don't think I can help you. Um, why don't you come with me? Let's go to the precinct. And maybe your mother is there already looking for you. And at that, Mary stood up, held the hands of the policeman, and together they went to the precinct. No mother there. Lots of people in the precinct. This kind policeman brought Mary inside a small room with a small window and told Mary, you stay here. And uh, if you need anything, just holler, and I'll be here in a flash. So Mary sat there. The policeman went his chores, and uh, Mary looked around. She felt lonely again, and once more, she started to sob. And then she cried and cried and cried and cried. Poor Mary. Pretty soon, she stopped crying and again looked around. And suddenly, when she fixed her gaze on one section of the room, her eyes became big and they became widened. And she called out, Mr. Policeman, Mr. Policeman, come here, come here, come here. And the policeman came running in. Why, Mary? Why, why? Mr. Policeman, you see that? Yes, that's a window. Yes, that's a window. But don't you see that? What? The policeman was asking. Outside that window. Yes, what is it? Well, it's a cross. Mr. Policeman, I know. I know now. 
the house where I live is just below the building where that cross is. Bring me at the foot of that cross, and when I am there, I will find my way home. The only thing I can think of with regard to that set of questions that that pastor gave me, that student gave me, and that member gave me, how to find their way home, I can only point them to Jesus. We need, we need to be brought back again at the foot of Jesus, at the cross, at the foot of the cross. When we are there, we will find our way home. The cross, the kingdom, the kingdom is all about the cross of Jesus. And the kingdom calls you, beckons you. Consider Jesus. Consider his cross. At the foot of the cross, when we are there, like Mary, we will find our way home. I don't know if you're lost. I don't know if you have any problem with you. I don't know if there is anything that's troubling you. I don't know if you're struggling spiritually. I don't know if you have a problem in life. Whatever it is, let me inv invite you to come to the foot of that cross. Come to Jesus. Lay all your burdens to Him, on Him. Let Him lead you. Let His Spirit give you a better understanding of who is the God of heaven and how this God of heaven, even in His greatness, can come down to us. Stay with us. And so fill our lives and our hearts with His Spirit. And with Him leading us, we will surely find our way home. Let me ask you this one question. If you have any problem, any concern you'd like to bring to my Jesus, if you have a challenge you're facing, and you want them to bring them to Jesus, you want them to be brought to Jesus, would you like to stand and uh, let's lay all our concerns on Jesus? I need Jesus. We need Jesus. Heavenly Father, there are many times when in the midst of our very, very busy schedule, times when suddenly we realize that we are lost, that the many problems that we face in life, sometimes they so overwhelm us that we just feel our need of you. And tonight, I pray, Father, that we'll, you will draw very, very close to each one of us. That you will lead us into understanding who you are and who Jesus is. There are still many things that we do not know about our Jesus. Help us to get to that understanding. Lead us, Father. And as we separate tonight, may what we learned tonight, may what we heard tonight lead us to long for Jesus and to know more about Him and what He can do for us. We thank you for the kingdom. We thank you for the King of the kingdom. 
please accept our commitment, accept our dedication, accept our puny faith, and lead us, O oh Father. Give us peace tonight as we sleep and wake us up again in the morning, ready to face the challenges of a new day, strengthened in our Jesus. In his worthy and powerful and wonderful name we pray. Amen. You may sit down. Thank you.